Hi, welcome to Stat Stuff. I'm Matt Hansen. This lesson is part of an extended series about the topic of process capability. In this lesson, I'll build off the lesson that covered the first three steps in the method for calculating process capability by showing how to do a capability analysis for non-normal distributions. The fourth step was for normal distributions, but this particular lesson on the fifth step is for non-normal distributions. So if you haven't already seen the previous lessons, then I strongly recommend that you review those first. But for now, let's begin by reviewing again what process capability is. Process capability refers to the voice of the process, or VOP, representing the standard set of metrics you might use to define how a process is performing or the capability of that process. Well, the example we've given before is if we have a distribution reflected here of the actual process performance. If we're following the define phase all the way through the DMAIC methodology, and the define phase here is when we're trying to understand the voice of the customer, or VOC. That's where the customer, uh, from them, they define for us the requirements or their expectations expectations for whatever it is they want us to perform from the process itself. Well, we might outline those based on the lower spec limit and upper spec limit, and anything within that portion refers to something that's good, something the customer is willing to pay for, the value added. And it's in the measure phase when we try to gather data, the data that we can trust, and data that we'll eventually be using to help measure the performance of the process, reflected again as process capability. So that's when we're trying to gather the data, and it's in the analyze phase that we described here where we're actually doing the calculation to figure out what is the capability of that process based off of that reliable data we collected in the measure phase. So here's where we're trying to fill out the blue portion here, where this reflects the lowest part of the range and the upper part of the range of the entire distribution representing our entire process and the performance and capability of that process. So here it's in the analyze phase then where we're defining what that process capability is and now we have something to compare it to that is to the voice of the customer, the VOC. And this is what's going to help us to understand the performance gap. How we're actually performing reflected here in the outer limits compared to what the customer wants or what their requirements are. Then the gaps here, these performance gaps reflect for us the opportunity where we might have some improvements, where we might use some data in the analyze phase again to figure out why we're not performing right. What are those opportunities to help reduce the variation in our process so we can perform what the customer wants. And once we identify those, that's where we identify then the fixes that we want to, to put into place to reduce those gaps, to minimize those gaps between how we're actually performing and what the customer wants, so we eliminate those defects. Once we've got the improvements, then we want to put some controls in place to help sustain those fixes and sustain those improvements. This is how we're following through the entire DMAIC methodology. Now, how do we calculate the actual process capability? Well, here's the illustration we've used before to illustrate how we would drill down to figure out the process capability, where it starts off with the first question we need to understand what data is that we're measuring. Well, based off of the type of data we're measuring, for example, if it's continuous data, the next question we're going to ask ourselves is, is the, can, is the process stable? We might use an IMR chart to figure that out. Well, if the process is not stable, then we really can't calculate the process capability. There's probably some special causes within our data that we need to fix and remove those special causes so that way we can get the process to some stable point where we can trust whether it's really stable or not and then begin to assess the capability of that process. So once we know then the process is stable, then we might go to the third question, which is figuring out is the data normal? and we'd run a normality test on that. If the data is normal, then we'll find ourselves drilling down to this fourth portion here, which is the capability analysis for normal data. But if the data is not normal based off of the normality test, we'll find ourselves using the capability analysis for non-normal data, where we'd use a Box-Cox transformation, for example, to run that particular analysis. However, if we go back to the original question and we're finding that the data we're using is actually discrete data, then we'll find ourselves using the capability analysis that's more for binomial type of data. Well, let's also quickly review again some of those capability analysis metrics that we've seen in the prior lesson. And that is, let's first go into like the DPMO, which is the defects per million opportunities. Again, that would reflect the count of the number of defects that are expected to occur for every one million opportunities that run through the process. Again, we calculate that by taking the total number of defects that we've seen in our example, and we divide that by the total number of units times the total opportunities per unit, and that would give us an overall percentage of what's defective. So we multiply that times one million in order to figure out what are the number of defects per million opportunities. Another metric we looked at was the z-score or the sigma level and this would reflect the voice of the process in relationship to the voice of the customer. It is a measurement of the severity of pain that's occurring in the process where we're not meeting the customer's requirements. 
So this was the calculation that we would use where it's z score is equal to the x which is some observation point minus the mean divided by the standard deviation where x could be something like a, an upper spec limit or a lower spec limit. So an example that we had used in the prior lesson was the z is equal to, again, that formula where we plugged in the upper spec limit of 1100, subtracted from that the mean of 521.6 divided by the standard deviation of 221.3. All in all, in doing this calculation, we ended up with a z score of 2.61. And we said because that is less than 3, we would determine then that the process is not quite capable because it's less than 3 standard deviations between the upper spec limit, which is what we plugged in here, and the mean. The other metrics that we looked at were CPK and PPK, where CPK is referring to the short-term process uh, capability and long-term capabilities reflected in the PPK. And this is all in relationship to the spread or that total tolerance between the lower spec limit and upper spec limit. So in all, what we're saying is how capable is the process within the customer's requirements, within their lower and upper spec limits defined by the customer. Well, if we find that the CPK is less than one, we said the process is not capable within the tolerance of the lower spec limit and upper spec limit. And if the CPK is above one, then that's much more capable because it's greater than three standard deviations fitting between the mean and that upper spec limit or lower spec limit. So the calculation we had for CPK, which is really similar, similar to the PPK, is we're taking the minimum between, or the lower value, between what's the upper spec limit minus the mean divided by three standard deviations over the short term. Or the mean subtracted the lower spec limit, again divided by the three standard deviations over the short term. Or in essence what we're saying is which is the lesser or minimum between the Z score for the upper spec limit divided by three or the Z score like we calculated above for the lower spec limit divided by three. Okay, now let's explore how you can begin to run the capability analysis for non-normal distributions. Well, now that we know we have non-normal data, how is it that we're going to measure the process capability for our non-normal data? Well, we're going to actually follow the same type of process capability like we did for the normal data with the Minitab, but instead we're going to allow Minitab to transform the data first for us into, into a somewhat normal data set. So what we're going to use is what's called the Box-Cox transformation. That's going to raise the data to the power of lambda, which ends up being a number somewhere between negative 5 and 5. Using this method, it's going to normalize that non-normal data for us so that we can calculate the process capability using very similar metrics like we've already seen when you run the process capability for a normal distribution. So when you go into the, the regular dialog box for the capability analysis for normal distributions, there's going to be a button there that says Box Cox. And you're going to click on that button, and clicking on that's going to give you this dialog box where we're going to check the box that says for a Box Cox power transformation. And we'll just use the optimal lambda, letting Minitab figure it out. When we click OK, we're going to get this kind of output from it. And again, this is where we found the path for this. And again, this is not something that's available in the student version of Minitab 14, but it's in the full version of Minitab. In this particular example, we ran this on metric B in our same sample data set. And again, in this sample data set, this is the one where it does come out as a non-normal data. By, by running this box transformation, though, it's going to take our data and transform it into this, what looks more like a normal distribution. And if you notice, some of the outputs that are on here are very similar to the same outputs we saw from the regular process capability. So even though the data might have looked like this originally, which is reflected up here in the upper left corner, it's transforming it into more of a normal distribution. And now it can calculate those same metrics for us. And again, we've got the same metrics of the parts per million, which is what we used for the actual data or the short term for the within piece, or the overall, which reflected the long term piece. As well, we still have our other metrics of the CPK and PPK, everything else that we've gone over before in the previous lessons about looking at the process capability for normal distribution. So we interpret this data in the same exact way. The only difference here is that we've run this box Cox transformation on it ahead of time so that we, we are more confident that we're looking at data that's, that's been normalized for us. All right, before we close this lesson, let's discuss how we can apply some of these concepts in a practical way. Well, I'd like you to go back to the two continuous metrics that you've used before when we're looking at the prior lessons regarding process capability. And for each of those metrics, now try to answer the question of, is the metric a continuous value from a stable process, yet in this case, is it having a non-normal distribution? Remember, those are the first three elements we want to look for in those first three steps of trying to figure out which process capability calculation method we're going to use. So if you find that is the case, that now this metric that you're looking at is for a non-normal distribution, then try to answer these questions 
questions based off the process capability that's been transformed using the box po boxcox transformation we talked about in this lesson. And that is figuring out what is the DPO, DPMO and what's the z-score. What's the cumulative probability or the percent effective? And what are the CPK and PPK? Based off of the results and running this capability analysis, then would you conclude that this process is capable or is it not capable? Well, that wraps up this lesson. Check out statstuff.com for many more resources that can help you achieve powerful results. I'm Matt Hansen. Thanks for watching.